Here we go. Let's get started. Okay, so last time we finished up talking about stimulants. Whoops, my stars. Um, last time we finished up talking about stimulants. Ooh, eight page differential pre-calc final. You know, I dropped pre-calc honors three times in high school, so I really admire you for sticking with it. Um, so today we're going to talk about dissociatives, which is one of my favorite topics and substances. Is anyone in here a dissociative nerd fan? Any of the above? Anyone in here like particularly fond of the dissociative class? Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. It's funny, I think that dissociatives are actually one of the cultier drug categories. Like people really tend to like go deep on knowing about dissociatives. I think because it requires such a higher level of digging than something like um, classical psychedelics because there's a lot of information available on classical psychedelics, but the most avid human guinea pigs that I've ever met have not been for psychedelics, they've been for dissociatives, which are under the broad category of hallucinogens, right? But remember that classical psychedelics are specific kind of hallucinogen that is known for acting on the 5-HT2A receptor, a specific kind of serotonin receptor that is responsible for um, creating perceptual changes in how you process your sensory environment. We don't really know a ton about that, but um, generally like a hallmark of being a classical psychedelic is acting on the 5-HT2A serotonin receptor. So if you see that in any kind of literature, you can get an immediate idea for the kind of effects that it might have. Um, let me open this chat real quick. Um, okay, so I'm just going to do a quick recap on this stuff because I edited out some gunk in here that I didn't like previously. Um, just some physiological effects of stimulants. The most immediate ones that I have on here are vasoconstriction, which is a tightening of blood vessels, as well as appetite suppression. But um, go ahead and yell out or put in the chat other physiological effects of stimulants. What else happens? Increased heart rate. Heart rate? What else? There's more. My dryasis. My dryasis. Not nearly to the same extent that other psychedelics, for instance, would have, but um, especially in like more crossover substances that are psychedelics and stimulants. And I mean, kind of like an a traditional sense, something like MDMA will like drastically dilate your pupils, right? And cocaine will also. Oh, yeah. Stim dick. That's true. Um, we didn't actually talk about it, but a lot of stimulants will like prevent orgasm. And that can be very inconvenient for people that are rolling and really love this person that they just met at this festival only to discover that you can't actually do anything with that information and you're gonna to have to wait until tomorrow. So that's something that is both a blessing and a curse depending on the community in which it's used, right? Like party and play and chemsex communities will often use stimulants on purpose for the sake of prolonging play. Um, and we're gonna to come haha, to that later. <laughs> Um, all right, neurotransmitters acted on by stimulants. What, it, what are the two major neurotransmitters that stimulants act on, the main ones? Rousing participation today, I see. I see the answer in the chat. So I guess I'm just gonna say it, which is dopamine and norepinephrine are the two main neurotransmitters that stimulants act on. Dopamine, reward feeling, motor control, et cetera. Um, norepinephrine, fight or flight, arousal, stimulation, makes sense. And then serotonin to a lesser extent, most if not all major stimulants will act to some degree on serotonin, but the degree to which they act varies. So for instance, cocaine has a more pronounced effect on serotonin than the amphetamine class with the exception of MDMA type drugs like MDMA and MDA obviously are very much serotonin agonists. They increase the effects of serotonin. Whereas you have something like amphetamine, which is predominantly a norepinephrine agonist and then a dopamine agonist. And they have kind of like an interesting interplay of effects where one of them increases the, the cellular concentration of the other. Um, so it's, it gets to be a little bit complicated. There's a lot of inter-system regulation that happens where increasing the effects of one neurotransmitter through a chain of events increases the effects of another. So sometimes it's not actually as simple as increasing the effects of dopamine straight up, sometimes increasing, oh, I, I, I wish I could remember which was which here, um, but I believe that it's actually that increasing the concentration of norepinephrine increases the concentration of dopamine indirectly through a chain of reactions. Um, but it could be reversed. Do not quote me on that. It's a messy quote. What is a crackback? 
and how can it be useful? Can I verbally state my answer? Yeah, go ahead. Um, a crackback is the pattern on um, a methamphetamine pipe, and it can be useful as in it can potentially show you what might be in your drug, but isn't the best way to test. That's an excellent answer. So um, generally a crackback, someone said in the chat, recrystallization from a meth pipe, yeah. Um, you can probably use crackbacks with other substances as well. I mean, you obviously can use crackbacks with other substances, but meth is a really predominant community in which crackbacks are used because of a variety of different um, adulterants that are currently circulating in the market, like ISO slash N-ISO, um, which can have kind of like intense hangover effects and be very uncomfortable, or something like MSN, methyl sulfonylmethane, which is a food supplement that just like doesn't have the desired effects and is a bulking agent. So, oops, let me turn my flex off. So using something like a crackback involves, geez, could you guys see my face get bluer? <laughs> using something like a crackback involves putting a little bit of your material in the bowl of your pipe and then heating it from below, allowing the um, vapor to kind of like escape. And this is kind of a, a low key homemade purification process that some people use with some mild effectiveness, you know, like doing a crackback actually does have some merit, even though it's not a perfect process. And um, after you allow the crystal to resolidify after melting it, you can look at the pattern and see if it has kind of like a dragonfly wing almost like shooting out in direct lines with some cracks across them, as opposed to like a pasty fractal or like a clumpy wet thing. A lot of really cute adjectives. Yes, yeah, Daft Punk retired. <laughs> Every Burning Man group on the internet has been making jokes about it nonstop, like absolutely nonstop for days to the point where some of them are getting shut down by moderators. <laughs> Um, what are some reasons why chronic stimulant use might harm the skin? And I'll circle back around to why this question is a problem in and of itself. Stimulants and skin. From the bad lifestyle habits, like bad hygiene, scratching, that kind of stuff? That is indeed. Um, I wouldn't say scratching necessarily. That's a pretty commonly perpetuated stigma against people that use stimulants because um, opioids can produce a histamine response. Opioids can actually produce like an allergic response that makes you feel itchy. And that's part of a reason why some people might actually feel itchiness. But that extends to like patients that are on morphine. Like itchiness is actually a really common side effect of pretty much all opioid use. Um, there are some that are worse about it than others, but I can't remember the hierarchy there. In the case of stimulants, it's kind of like a common stigma that like people scratch and itch and like pick their skin and whatever because they feel bugs under their skin. And like, okay, it is definitely like a thing. Delusional parasitosis is a thing where like a tiny subset of people will feel bugs under the skin, but that's not like the average experience of someone that uses stimulants, right? That that's part of an outlier set, generally speaking. So when we're looking at skin damage from stimulants as especially we see those like meth billboards, right? That have the before and after photos that are so so terrifying. Oftentimes when people do experience skin damage from stimulants, which usually is marketed as being from meth or crack, even though it really can be from like stimulants as a class that you're using frequently, is thought to be largely an issue of like lifestyle changes and hygiene. Exactly like you said, that was totally right. Um, and also in some cases from vasoconstriction and a lack of blood flow to different areas of the skin because your skin needs blood flow to rebuild itself correctly. So those are the two major ways that stimulant, like chronic stimulant use can impact the skin. Let's work to debunk the myth. I've long suspected the itchy feeling of opiates was due to your skin nerves slowly waking up. Well, there's an interesting phenomenon with opiates or opioids as a class where um, sometimes you can have rebound pain afterwards where the pain that you were trying to treat in the first place gets worse after you stop your treatment, especially if you're going through withdrawal. So that's like not quite nerves waking up necessarily, but um, it, it's interesting. Like the mechanism of itch in the human body is like a mystery. <laughs> we're like clueless about why you scratch itches. Like we can put people on Mars. We can put rovers on Mars that draw dicks, but we don't know why you get itches that you need to scratch. Uh, what is parachuting? I feel like someone's going to be literal about this. 
Yes, taking the drug and toilet paper. One ply, please. Don't try and use Charmin Ultra for your uh, parachuting. It's going to get stuck in your mouth and melt into this gross wad and be disgusting. I do not recommend it. Um, I would much I'd rather advise that you use a single tiny little square of toilet paper. Wrap up your substance and roll it into a pill shape. Pop it like a pill. This is effective because it can bypass the gelatin capsule that takes a little longer to break down. Um, so it is, toilet paper is so 2020, hashtag bidet gang. That's the kind of gold that we get in the chat for those of you who are watching and not here live. <laughs> this is what I'm looking at while we're doing this. Can you use rolling papers for parachuting? Um, that's actually a good question. I'd imagine so. I can't really see any any issue with it unless like you would probably want to look at what your rolling papers are made of just to be sure there's nothing like toxic in them i guess or something that shouldn't be swallowed um imagine not using a bidet to boof okay that's enough of the chat for now so parachuting is when you roll up your substance and then you put it in a little piece of toilet paper and then you swallow it what is an snbri What does it stand for? I wish any of you in here had been part of the in-person drug scope classes because near the end of the I'll semester. Uh, at, what is it? Oh, there it is. It's someone wrote it already. That's okay. You can say it. Uh, serotonin. Oh, shit. You got it. it. Serotonin, noradrenaline, dopamine reuptake inhibitor? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I oh, prefer sorry. norepinephrine, but like, yes, that's absolutely correct. Selective, Serotonin. Nor selective, selective noradrenaline dopamine reuptake inhibitor. Okay, got it. This one, well, no, this is an SNDRI is, is serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine reuptake inhibitor. Um, it can be selective or non-selective depending on what it's doing. But like um, in the cases of Cocaine, for instance, cocaine is an SNDRI. It's a select, it's a serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine reuptake inhibitor. It's a huge mouthful. Um, the level of selectivity in that process basically means if it's like honed in on a specific kind of receptor within that class of neurotransmitter. So a uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor and SSRI, for instance, will specifically seek out reuptake transporters for specific kinds of serotonin neurotransmitters like 5-HT2A or 5-HT2B or whatever. So there's the big class of neurotransmitter. And then within that, there are subsets of specific kinds of receptors that do slightly different things within that class, which is how you get something like serotonin receptors include 5-HT2A receptors, which are predominantly responsible for creating psychedelic effects, but they also include 5-HT2B receptors, which are largely responsible for mitigating heart activity, among other things, cardiac activity. So that's kind of like a, an interesting thing to note about how just because something acts on serotonin doesn't mean that that's it. Like there's a bunch of ways within that that it can act on serotonin and the receptor that it binds to is a major part of that thing. Oh, weird. Whoops. Okay. It showed it. Well, these are tutors. I think that's a fantastic name. Anyone remember? Oh, I'd be surprised. I th actually think we skipped this last time, but that's punding, um, which is a symptom of Parkinson's disease, which is like, and I think it's also uh, expressed on the autism spectrum of repetitive obsessive motions, like doing a thing repeatedly and how punding can be expressed in different ways. There is definitely some speculation about how um, chronic amphetamine use or amphetamine type stimulant use can cause symptoms of punding, even in the form of just like obsessive repetition of a task, like online shopping, for instance. So we're not gonna dive too deep into that because that's an area that is like, I think kind of constantly under evolution and we're just starting to see an influx of people sharing their experiences with it. But um, there is definitely like an aspect of obsessive repetitive action to chronic amphetamine or stimulant use in some cases. Um, sorry, I'm just going through this, I guess. And this is a piso, a meth pipe, um, can also be used to smoke crack, can be just used to smoke crystal in general. Eating nine peanut butter cups in one sitting is bad for you. And uh, yeah, this is what you would do a crack back in. The bottom of this pipe looks really dirty. That's gross. Let's talk about dissociatives. So dissociation, for those of you that are not familiar with this as a concept, a therapeutic concept, dissociation is a feeling of separation or disconnectedness from yourself or from your environment. Now, there are two general ways that this is categorized, which is depersonalization or derealization. Depersonalization is when you feel disconnected from yourself. This is often described as looking at yourself from above or watching yourself um, complete house on autopilot. 
then there's derealization, which is a feeling of separation or separateness from your environment, from your surroundings. So these are kind of like used a little bit interchangeably sometimes to describe the umbrella experience of being dissociated. If you've ever had a moment where you've like stepped outside into the bright sunlight and felt like everything was really far away and like you were watching a movie through your eyes, you might have been having a moment of dissociation. Personally, I think that dissociation is an extremely common experience that a lot of people don't really know to name and identify. So it, this might be something that's interesting to kind of look into because dissociation is like it happens to a lot of people and it can be clinical in some cases and also is often brought on by trauma especially developmental trauma. So generally as a class, dissociatives are known for their pain relieving effects as anyone who has accidentally headbanged themselves into the ER can tell you. That's an anecdote, not about me, but about someone I went to a rave with who didn't realize that they'd sprained their chest until the next morning and then had to go to the ER twice. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it was at a Nightmare and Slander show. It was a good vibrations, if that means anything to anyone here. So analgesia is another word for pain relief. It is a reduction of pain signaling in the body. There's a specific way that this can happen. John, you are never too old to headbang. You just have to do it with the right technique. Um, and then also sedation and tranquilization. Now, the interesting thing about this is that many dissociatives used at recreational levels are actually kind of stimulating and not necessarily sedating. It really depends on which dissociative you're doing though, because at a sufficient threshold, you will uh, pass out. <laughs> I've witnessed this happen on a couple of different substances, especially if you combine with alcohol, which we'll come back to in a second. But generally dissociatives are, are often used in surgical contexts or in the context of like, of I almost said seducing, of sedating and calming people. Um, but they also have kind of depressant effects. And this is an interesting one because this class is very much, as we'll see in a second, a crossroads of a lot of different um, properties. So it's very important to treat every dissociative as its own unique compound. And I'll explain why when we talk about ketamine's respiratory effects in a little bit. But kind of like qualitatively, at low recreational doses, a lot of dissociatives or dissos as they're known, um, will feel a little bit like alcohol. But like, it really depends on the specific one. And that's like low dips. <laughs> you go above that threshold, you'll be like, I'm not in Kansas anymore. And this is absolutely nothing like drinking a gin and tonic. So some major effects of dissociatives are the depersonalization or derealization, uh, disconnecting from yourself or your environment. Um, hallucinations on dissociatives can be kind of strange. Uh, dissos are a very weird class of drug. Uh, a good way I would describe them is that particularly on ketamine, the experience is often one of, I am aware that I am euphoric right now and having a very good time. And it's kind of like that. So it's an interesting mixture of different things. Like it's a very calm uh, experience. And what I find to be particularly notable about dissociatives is that oftentimes um, people have an easier time navigating this class of drugs because you don't care quite as much about when an experience is a little bit scary or unsettling. And that's not universal. Do not just like run with that and say, I'm gonna do giant K-hole doses of dissociatives because I won't care. Like you'll probably still care, but I would say that like, it's a lot easier to maintain composure as opposed to like doing a heroic dose of mushrooms, personally speaking. And then they also induce like a trance-like state. So often kind of like floating through your environment, feeling like you're walking on cotton balls. You're just kind of like moving through stuff and going on autopilot. Your, your movements feel kind of like soft and padded and like muffled almost is how I would describe it. Now this crossroads is very interesting because you get characteristics of all kinds of drugs in dissociatives. Oftentimes dissociatives will have some kind of opioid effect, some kind of opioid agonist analgesic effect that can induce pain relief or um, some kind, sometimes bliss or sedation or comfort because generally opioids activate the network in the brain that is responsible for making us feel comforted, making us feel held. Like you're wrapped in a warm blanket on a rainy day. That's kind of like the opioid experience for a lot of people, not necessarily euphoric, but like comfort, like things are as they should be. You don't really care about the pain. 
And that's an interesting thing about opioids that we'll come back to when we talk about them later is that it doesn't take the pain away necessarily. It just makes you not give a fuck about it. Um, then they also share effects of depressants, which can be GABA agonists that reduce your overall central nervous system activity, but not all of them do this in this way. Um, and oftentimes inhalants also have dissociative qualities to some degree. Now, a prime example of this is nitrous, which is at the intersection of all three of these things. It has opioid-like qualities, GABA agonist qualities, um, NMDA receptor antagonist qualities. We'll get to what that is in a second, but it's also something you inhale. Now, really the only reason for d distinguishing inhalants from the other classes here is that inherently, when you're inhaling something, that will tell you a lot about what the experience will be like. If you're inhaling something, it's going to be short lasting, most likely, because your lungs will kind of process it very quickly. It will hit you extremely fast because it gets to the bloodstream so fast. And it also carries kind of like a higher risk of being hit really hard and fast to the point of maybe passing out in some cases or being overwhelmed having it be kind of like a compulsive activity because you need to be constantly re-upping on it. So um, this is just an important crossroads to note. We'll come back to that in a second. Uh, yeah, if, if we have diso nerds in here, you can feel free to drop your favorite dissociatives or like ones that you find interesting in the chat. Uh, just so we can have some interesting discourse about alphabet soup. Because <laughs> for those of you that are not interested or not into dissociative uh, culture, you'll see a lot of these and be like, I've never seen that in my life. But everyone's like, oh yeah, that was a classic from 2018 on Reddit. So let's go back to the government real quick because the government and dissociatives are like absolute peas and carrots. In the 60s, the government was extremely interested in inducing controlled psychosis. This has been a major thing. We're going to talk about this when we go over the Manchurian Candidate and MK Ultra and Project Artichoke and shit very soon. Um, the whole goal here was basically we want to be able to reprogram people and make them spill their secrets. That's like a major thing. But to their surprise, they actually found that while they were testing the effects of psychedelics for this, like classical psychedelics like LSD, that dissociatives were more effective at inducing psychosis-like properties than psychedelics. In fact, the experience had on many dissociatives actually shares like pretty distinguishable traits with psychotic disorders. And that's not to say that they induce psychotic disorders necessarily, just that this class of substance gives us a very interesting window into the working experience of a person who is experiencing a break from lucidity, a break from processing reality, like Pink Floyd. You take in information, you project it correctly into what it actually is internally. Um, kind of like how your brain takes in information upside down and then flips it inside your brain, which is cool. I'm just reading through your dissociative recommendations. <laughs> Honestly, I don't even know if I like dissos. That's a quote that I've heard from so many people who are on them. <laughs> so many times people have been, I've been like, what do you think of this experience? And they're like, I'm not sure. Maybe I like it. <laughs> That's as far as they get with that, that line of logic. I'm seeing HXC, DMXC, OPCE, 3HOPCP, uh, Xenon, Sage, MK801. DXM, did 250 milligrams of DXM and got lost in a mall and had to call my friend to escort me out of the bathroom. God, I love experience reports. Now for the major chemistry of dissociatives, here is um, scary diagram number 18 million. So this is what we call the NMDA receptor. It's fun to party with NMDA. Let's don't forget that N. How do you make an N? N M D A. I think I got that right once. So this receptor is a specific place where a specific kind of glutamate binds. So remember, within a neurotransmitter category, you have little bitty categories of different kinds of neurotransmitters that do slightly different things, or I'm sorry, receptors that do slightly different things with glutamate. So this specific case, uh, is a receptor that accepts NMDA, which is like a subset of the glutamate neurotransmitter class, basically. Now, when you clog it up, you prevent 
glutamate from binding at this receptor. You prevent it from doing its thing. The reason that I'm telling you the name of this specific receptor is because this is basically like the holy grail of what makes it associative and dissociative. If it binds at the NMDA receptor, if it's an antagonist at that receptor, it will probably have dissociative effects. So like the 5-HT2A receptor, you can get a really immediate idea for, if you're reading a publication about a new drug, it'll be like NMDA receptor antagonist or NMDAR antagonist. And instantly you can be like dissociative class. Isn't that helpful? I think that's really helpful because then you can just kind of go in and read about drugs and get in a rabbit hole. And instead of having to Google everything, you can just like, no, this is glutamate. Glutamate is a neurotransmitter that helps connect your brain and your body. If you disrupt that connection, you're going to disrupt communication between your brain and your body. If you do that, you'll feel dissociated. It all makes sense. It all fits together. Now, um, some major dissociatives in this category, can't even see behind the chat, are PCP, nitrous, DXM, and ketamine. And these are the four major ones that we'll be talking about. Less so DXM because it's just not that popular for reasonable reasons. Um, reading the chat real quick. It's the glue to mate that connects your body together. That's cute, Shark. Thank you. So generally speaking, the mechanism of action of dissociatives involves, is it going to increase or decrease the activity of glutamate? Up or down? Decrease, that's right. Okay, so generally speaking, dissociatives decrease the activity of glutamate. That's your connective neurotransmitter and it's involved in memory and learning. Now that's funny because dissociatives are very helpful for unlearning maladaptive behaviors, unlearning maladaptive pathways and processes, which we'll come back to in a minute. Um, in terms of GABA, what do you think? GABA decrease or increase or decrease? Knowing what we know about dissociatives and what we know about GABA. We'll do a neurotransmitter review in a second increase. That's right. GABA is your inhibitory neurotransmitter. GABA calms your system down. It's your opposite of your fight or flight. So if you increase your calming neurotransmitter, your body will be relaxed and sedated. What about opioids? Increase or decrease? Natural endogenous opioid processing. Increase or decrease? That's right. Increase. And dopamine. Now this is kind of like a more obscure one. Like in some, some cases, dopamine is impacted by dissociatives, but not all. Quantum jump of dopamine might be a bit of a stretch, but there could be some dopamine agonism, right? Agonism means increasing the effects of the neurotransmitter. Now, real quick, because I'm sure that many of you have forgotten this, if this is your first brush with this kind of thing, just a refresher about what all of the neurotransmitters are and what they do. This uh, trophy symbol is for dopamine, your reward, your mood, um, goal seeking behavior, it basically says, oh, you should do that. That will make you feel good. And then it makes you feel good when you do it. So this is rewarding things that are biologically advantageous and stimulants are typically going to have the most pronounced impact on dopamine. Then you have norepinephrine, which is your fight or flight. And, uh, or you could say norepinephrine because that's fun, but don't actually say that in any academic setting because you will get daggers. Uh, this is predominantly impacted by stimulants as well, right? It hypes your body up. It gets you ready to move, ready to go. I wish I'd had some more of that today. So I could have gotten any work done. Then there's serotonin, which is predominantly influencing your perception, how you process the information that you take in. So this has impact on your mood and your sociability and your emotions. And generally speaking, both psychedelics and MDMA type drugs will have the most substantial impact on serotonin, although stimulants can impact serotonin as well. Like for many of the things that we're looking at here, even though there are like main categories that, that will influence these neurotransmitters, it's not set in stone, you know, like, um, there are certainly a, a whole wide variety of drugs that will kind of like, surprise, I impact dopamine, and it's not like necessarily perfectly in line for the category that it falls under. Glutamate, excitatory neurotransmitter, that means it's involved in connection. So glutamate is like ring, ring, you're in pain, and then you pull your hand off of the stove, basically. So uh, this is predominantly affiliated with dissociatives, right? Reduces communication between brain and body. And then there's GABA, which is inhibitory. So it's the opposite of glutamate. Glutamate is all about the connection. GABA is all about 
we're not talking to each other right now. We're doing less. So GABA is inhibitory. It slows down the system and usually depressants will act on it. Now, um, this might be kind of like a weird thing to wrap your head around if you're like, okay, well, glutamate is reduced by dissociatives. So isn't that like the same as increasing GABA? Wouldn't that make sense? Like you have glutamate, which is all about communication and GABA, which is all about calming you down. So if they're like this and you decrease communication and calm down on this hand, like wouldn't they have the same effect? That doesn't make sense, right? But the differentiation is that glutamate isn't necessarily telling your body, oh, like make your heart rate slower, like slow down your um, automatic arousal, autonomic arousal. It's not doing that. It's facilitating like talky talky between different areas. Whereas GABA is like anti fight or flight. If that doesn't make sense, I can clarify. Uh, generally speaking, dissociatives are used in medical contexts for the purpose of antidepressant effects at this point in time in a therapeutic sense. Uh, well, actually, that's all the way over here. DXM, not that popular, clearly never attended Canadian high school. <laughs> I should, I should rephrase. Oh, that reminds me. I have something to say about um, amphetamine. I was called out for misinformation last time. This is very important. In the stimulants lecture, I had um, incorrectly titled a slide isomers that did not actually contain isomers. Um, and as a non-chemist, I will happily report that the word I'm about to put in the chat is one that I cannot pronounce correctly. I am. If someone wants to say it right, unmute yourself. Enantiomers. Bless you. So enantiomers are actually the mirror images of which we speak in the case of amphetamine. We're not necessarily even mirror images. Honest to God, I'm not a chemist. I cannot completely clarify this fact. Yeah. Uh, however, I received a lovely paragraph of explanation from the person in question which I will share at the end of this and not right now because that would be really inconvenient, but I'll do that. Um, about DXM though, I would say it's just not as convenient. Like DXM is, I would say largely on a recreational scale. It's pretty uncomfortable. And yes, a lot of people use DXM. I'm not going to like negate that fact whatsoever. Um, for our intents and purposes, since it's an over-the-counter thing that you can acquire. I am not going to prioritize talking about it quite as much in the DISOS class, just because there is a little bit more information available about its pharmacology than about these other substances. Um, how much cough syrup do you need in order to trip on DXM? Oh, geez. I actually, I don't remember the exact dosage, but I think it's like a hundred milligrams or something. I'm not sure. I'll look that up on Psychonomicky. So um, dissociatives, right? Anxiolytic, they can be social lubricants in some cases. Yes, Alexis, go in about the four plateaus of DMT. Oh, that's right. Yeah, a lot of cough syrup combinations have acetaminophen in them, which is Tylenol. And that shit is not good for your liver. And I actually know someone who died from taking Tylenol every day for three years. Like, it's no joke. It's really no joke. Like Tylenol and NSAIDs, like um, Aleve slash naproxen and ibuprofen, NSAIDs are really, really hard on your stomach lining to the point where they can actually burn holes in it if you're using it that often. And uh, Tylenol is really, really hard on your liver. So like, don't underestimate those things for real. Now looking at mental illness, um, there's actually a term psychotomimetic, and that is specifically referencing like this drug mimics the effects of psychosis and dissociatives fall under that category. So if you have a family history of psychotic disorders or a personal history of psychotic disorders or just like a general loss of lucidity, then dissociatives definitely have the potential to exacerbate those symptoms or even bring them out in the first place. So be very mindful of this with dissociatives. Um, and then in terms of depression, this is something that we'll get into in much more detail in just a minute, but this NMDA receptor antagonist action, right, is very interesting because it flies in the face of what we currently know about how depression works. So when we started discovering that ketamine of all drugs has a profound antidepressant effects, 
it really made science step back and be like, okay, we've operated on the basis of serotonin being the deficit that is largely responsible for depressive symptoms. So how and why is it that glutamate all of a sudden is what we're looking at here? And it makes sense because in a lot of people that have anxiety, that have PTSD, that have OCD, that have depression, there is an excess amount of glutamatergic activity in the brain. So quelling and calming that excess activity does make sense. Personally, I think that all of these could be used in conjunction for not only a fabulous time, but also very effective treatment, but maybe that's biased. So um, a major interaction that I want to point out here is dissociatives and alcohol. This one is very near and dear to my heart. Having witnessed a lot of puke in a lot of parking lots, in a lot of forests, on a lot of faces from a lot of people who have decided to do fatty bumps of ketamine and then drink a lot of booze. These two things don't really play nicely with each other because they drastically potentiate the effects of the other to the point where it's pretty common to black out and get spins if you mix these substances. Um, the extent to which this is dangerous really depends on the specific dissociative that you're mixing. Yes, don't slap the bag while you're on K. It will not end well. I, I swear to you, like you will get spins. Even mixing one drink and one bump of ketamine for a lot of people is enough to like black out. <laughs> and with ketamine in particular, the most significant thing about this is actually puking and choking on it. It's not respiratory depression because of something that we'll talk about in a second. But just generally speaking, know that mixing any quantity of alcohol with dissociatives has serious potential to make you have a real bad time that may or may not cause like near fatality, depending on the quantity and the specific dissociative. Um, now let's look at Kitty Kitty. Uh, ketamine is maybe my favorite drug to talk about. I have a lot of love in my heart for this substance because it is just like fascinating, like fascinating. K has an enormous variety of things to offer and to take away. And it is just like a very um, versatile substance, very versatile substance. Standard dose is approximately 30 to 70 milligrams. However, a lot of people bump in the like 15 milligram range, just like a key bump scoop is not actually 30 milligrams a lot of the time. But the general tendency is to do a bump, wait three and a half minutes and be like, man, I'm not feeling it. And then do another bump until all of a sudden you don't remember where in the United States you are located or whatever country that you're in. Or as one person once turned to me and said, Rwanda isn't real because they were going to go abroad there. <laughs> they were like, that's not a real place. So um, be mindful about constantly bumping ketamine because it can really take you places. Now, ketamine is also known as kitty or special K, but usually special K is a phrase that's used by like law enforcement and people that don't actually know anything about ketamine. Um, is any country real? An excellent question. Shower thoughts with drugs go. Uh, it's commonly known as Ket or K, K, honestly, is like it's mostly known as K or Kitty Kitty. Like if you're looking for K at a party, sometimes you hear people going, meow, meow, and sometimes that works for them miraculously. And if you're just high on K, it's rocking. Oh, I was trying to remember what it was, what the word for it was. But like if you're rocking, you're on K. I think that might be a regional thing, though, for the West Coast. And then there's also K hold, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. Generally speaking, ketamine comes in powder form um, or you can buy liquid vials of it. Now, an important thing to note about liquid versus powder versus crystal. Many things can, or a lot of people feel better about what their substance looks like if it's like either this like fine crystalline powder or big fat rocks, or it's in liquid or something like that, that they deem to be less likely to be cut. But the unfortunate and simple fact of the matter is that if someone gets a vial of liquid ketamine, because that's usually where it starts. In fact, I think that's pretty much always where it starts. You get a vial of liquid K, you can buy them in Mexico and bring them over the border if you're really careful. And because it's a schedule three substance and also you can like, there's a certain amount that you can actually buy in ketamine or buy in Mexico. And you're not supposed to bring it back, but people do. And um, usually you can take that little vial of liquid and dump it out into a container or a platter 
And if you are just like getting it straight from source and it's actual veterinary or human medicine grade ketamine, then you can put it on like a Pyrex dish or some kind of glass plate and either just like let the water evaporate out or the saline evaporate out, depending on what it's mixed with and get crystals. And then you take a razor blade or a card and you just scrape them up and bada bing, you got fluff. Um, now, a lot of people assume that that's what they're getting when they get a vial of liquid K. They're like, oh, good. Like it's liquid. That means it's straight from the doctor. But all someone has to do is dump a bag of crystals into some liquid and mix it up, some saline or some water even, um, and mix it up. And then you can just add whatever you want to it. <laughs> like that's it. Then it's liquid again. And so it's just not enough for it to be liquid. Like if you want the real deal for liquid, you want like sealed medical labeled vials. And that's the only way that you can be sure, unless you know someone that specifically brought it back. Um, when it comes to powder form, K is a pretty freaking adulterated substance. Yeah, the market is very heavily saturated right now with um, research chemical dissociatives, very heavily saturated. There's kind of a ketamine drought in the United States, depending on where you are. Generally, if you snort it, you come up in five to 15 minutes. It hits you pretty quickly, but for many people, not quickly enough. And then they do another scoop and it only lasts for about 45 minutes to an hour. Now, this is extremely convenient for a lot of reasons. Namely that you can go to a show, be so high that you don't know what country you're in, and an hour later you can drive your car. Now, it should be noted that you shouldn't drive your car an hour later. You should always allow a substance more than adequate time to exit your body. But it's just an interesting comparison to a drug like alcohol, where if you get fucked up enough to like really let loose at a show, you cannot drive home and you're probably going to have a really shitty day the next day. And for this reason, ketamine is very popular in many party scenes because it, at lower doses, produces that similar kind of like floaty feeling. Not everyone feels uninhibited on um, ketamine, though. Some people get really uncomfortable. This is not like the perfect substance. And uh, it just, it creates a kind of different social atmosphere, I would say, socially. Duh. And when, when you IM it, it's a lot faster. If you IM it or IV it, it's very bioavailable, which means it gets absorbed very effectively and it lasts a little bit of a shorter duration, not by that much, but a little bit shorter. You come up very, very quickly. Um, and this is the predominant use for therapeutic settings. Imagine if you go and your doc lays out a line and is like, all right, <laughs> might hurt a little bit. So I got you a second straw for your other nostril from when the first one feels kind of raw. Generally speaking, ketamine is a very, very, very powerful NMDA receptor antagonist. It is mostly acting on the NMDA receptor. It means it's mostly acting on glutamate, reducing communication between brain and body. Um, it also has some, app, some action on GABA, which means that it also has like a mild depressant effect, but it's mild, uh, very mild comparatively, and also like a mild opioid effect as well. Um, but what's interesting about K and several other dissociatives is that it actually also activates your fight or flight to a minor extent. And this is part of the reason that this is an effective club drug, because unlike opioids, which are very much predominantly sedating in nature, um, as well as classical depressants, very much predominantly sedating in nature, just because you're getting less communication between brain and body doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to pass out or that you're going to experience that like major sleepiness, right? Um, is reagent testing reliable for K or the RC is capable of testing similarly? I hate testing ketamine with reagents. It is not a fun process. Yes, 2-FTCK will react exactly the same way as ketamine, for instance. Um, let me see what you said. Prototype reagent being developed to differentiate 2-FDCK from ket. Please keep me updated on that one. Um, yeah, no, 2-FDCK will react exactly the same as ketamine on reagents across the board. I have seen this happen in person. So uh, this is like GCMS verified. However, it's very common for 2-FDCK or DCK to be mixed in with ketamine. So that really complicates the effects of things. Um, 
Yeah, I would say that for the time being, you should use advanced lab testing if you want to really be certain of which dissociative you have, because we're currently in the process of trying to parse this, um, but it's it's very difficult to tell the dissociatives apart right now because many of them don't react at all. And when you use mandolin on ketamine, it can react like a huge range of different colors, which is fucking frustrating as hell. So for instance, um, oftentimes I see kind of like a pissy little orange color. Sometimes you get the promised dark brown color. Sometimes you even get like kind of an olive green color. And all of these might be indicative. There's speculation, I believe, as to which isomer of ketamine will react in certain ways, but I'm not positive on that one. Um, yeah, FDIR is not the most reliable by any stretch of the imagination. If you get access to GCMS through drugs data, for instance, we'll talk about all kinds of advanced lab testing later if this all sounds like gibberish to you, um, then that is a much more reliable way to go with this kind of thing. High rate of people getting naked on ketamine compared to any other dissociative. Definitely, Charles, you're gonna need to cite your source on that one. Absolutely will want to see some kind of evidence for that claim, that is a big one. Uh, the nakedness thing with dissociatives in general, what's up with that? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a really funny question. Yes, I would say that compared to other substances, there does seem to be like a dissociative heavy emphasis on people getting nakey nakey. However, that happens very frequently on psychedelics as well. And by very frequently, I mean extremely infrequently, just like compared to like your average baseline sober person, their likelihood of stripping down nakey nakey compared to someone that's on two tabs of acid compared to someone that's on a bunch of PCP or ketamine, which are more similar than you might think. Um, I would say that dissociatives have of those three very low likelihoods, the highest low likelihood, generally speaking. Um, I like, again, a lot of this just has to do with like a detachment from reality that can happen at higher doses of dissociatives. And um, yeah, that's all I really have on that one because there's not really a lot of like data. <laughs> I don't really think that I've seen a guy at a festival with a clipboard being like, well, oh, there's one more person who's naked, better go run after them and get their pee sampled so I can know what drug they're on because that's impossible. And I think a lot of it ends up being speculation. In terms of subjective effects of 2-FDCK and ketamine, 2-FDCK um, hurts, shit burns. It is an unpleasant snorting experience, I would say. Um, it is a longer high, like one to three hours, maybe even four hours, quite a bit of after effects and come down, far less euphoric and um, kind of like a weird like a nice body high, but it's it's very much not as friendly as ketamine, I think. Um, 2-FDCK tends to be kind of like a, a little bit of a grungier, more extended version of ketamine that also produces some strange like dream state scapes, which is a pretty common thing on dissociatives and just drugs in general is dreamscapes where you have this kind of like eyes closed, you're not hallucinating necessarily, but you might like relive memories very, very vividly or like really feel the distance of time. And that's how dissociatives are such a strange class because they're less overtly hallucinogenic, which can make it a bit more difficult to differentiate between drug and reality for some people in some cases. Um, DCK is yes, dyschloroketamine. Um, Easier to get unadulterated 2-FDCK. Yeah, 2-FDCK is very, very much on the rise in the supply chain right now. It's being produced in China in bulk and it is being cut into ketamine all over the place. Um, I've seen it very much like infiltrating the market recently as an adulterant. Spravato, oh God, yeah. I have a lot of issue with, with Spravato. Yes, and, and that's an excellent note about um, not regarding 2F as a replacement. For any of you here, if you are trying out a new substance of any kind that has been promised to replicate the effects of a substance that you love that is illicit or maybe neurotoxic like MDMA, um, that will set you up for failure. Every new drug is a new drug. So for instance, this fabled borax combo, which is supposedly going to replicate the effects of MDMA with less crash and less come down and less neurotoxicity, that's like 
two FMA, five MAPB, and four HOMET or something like that, which again, for many of you might sound like complete alphabet soup. TLDR, people try to replicate the effects of their favorite drugs using multiple other different drugs or just one other different drug. And you're just going to get a different experience. It's never going to be identical to that experience. So ensure that you have a realistic expectation of the fact that whatever you're about to do is not going to be exactly like what you are looking forward to necessarily. Expectation is the enemy of progress, but it's really hard to dismiss it. Um, ketamine, generally speaking, again, has this like very predominant floaty feeling of being springy and moving in a muffled environment. It makes dancing feel really, really good. It's a very tactile substance, interestingly, despite the fact that it reduces your um, touch sensation and also a feeling of disconnection from your body. Um, in some cases, if you're pretty hold, which is pretty K-hold, which means that you've We'll come back to what a K-hole is in a minute, actually. At higher doses of ketamine, you can get um, open eye visuals if you're like really high. But generally by that point, it's not so much that you have open eye visuals, but that your brain is projecting scenes over what you are seeing. Like your intake of information becomes kind of like, <laughs> so it's not like acid where you see like generative patterns necessarily. I would say that's less common. Um, however, Sprinting on, sprinting flat out on K feels amazing. <laughs> Never thought I'd hear that. I love reading this chat. <laughs> it brings me so much joy. So um, closed eye visuals, however, while you're on a very high dose of ketamine are not uncommon. Let's take a look at David Guetta. And the speculation was that he's high on ketamine while playing this set. And I don't know if it's true or not, but I think it'd be really funny if it were. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but that seems like it might actually be like exactly what's going on. And then there's this guy trying to get up a hill on ketamine. My favorite part of that is that the title is Guy on Ketamine Attempts Slight Incline. <laughs> okay, so now for the K hole in the last couple of minutes that we have on this, I could go on about K all day long, fam. So, um, oh yeah, walking upstairs on K is wild disoriented and can be lots of fun. Oh yeah, stairs and ketamine are a whole different level of challenge. So the K hole is basically like you've reached peak being high on K. This is a complete like kind of dissociative detached experience that can easily become ego death. Um, I find stairs dangerous, even sober. Some serious risk takers in this chat. <laughs> Disso crowd, am I right? They do stairs. So K holing or holing is something that not everyone actually wants. Um, and it can be pretty disorienting and intense if someone isn't expecting it. So for instance, someone that does a line of what they think is cocaine that is actually ketamine and all of a sudden they find themselves hold, which means that you have very little if any communication with the outside world. And that can be really disorienting, especially if you are drunk. That really changes the experience and the spins are like nothing you would believe seriously. Um, and this is like an anesthetic state largely, like you are anesthetized. Your ability to move inside of your body is drastically reduced, if not entirely eliminated. It's an anesthetic, fam. Come on, I said fam twice and I really hate myself for it. 
never say it again. So in medicine, ketamine is extremely useful for traumatic head injuries in particular, or just traumatic injuries, and in pediatric medicine, because unlike other sedatives and pain relievers, it does not actually depress your breathing, your circulation, or your blood pressure, at least anywhere near the extent that things like opioids would. So this is on the World Health Organization's list of top 100 most effective and safe medications, because it is essential for all kinds of surgical operations. It's been being used successfully for many, many years in these contexts and others. In the more therapeutic sense, um, ketamine is a Schedule Three substance in the United States, which means that it's not actually that heavily criminalized comparatively. And partly for this reason, you can find it at ketamine infusion clinics across the country where you can just make an appointment with someone who's like a nurse practitioner and just go get some case slapped into you for a couple hours. It's usually about 500 bucks per hour long treatment. And you have to do like eight of them in two weeks, <laughs> generally. Um, the effectiveness of ketamine as a treatment for depression has been shown to be approximately twice as effective as current existing treatments to the point where it's used widely in patients with suicidal ideations in emergency contexts with extraordinarily successful effects. I believe that the statistic there is like 70 to 80% of people experience a drastic reduction in suicidal ideation within like minutes or hours of being administered ketamine. It's massive. Um, we don't have a complete safety and dosing regimen, and we'll come back to ketamine bladder cystitis next time. We only have like two minutes to go here. And once nearly suffocated because my nostrils got too plugged. <sighs> anyway, so the effects of ketamine do generally take place within hours or even like within the course of the treatment span, and they generally last approximately 10 days after your last infusion. And that's one of the issues that we're trying to combat here right now. However, existing antidepressant regimens take approximately four to six weeks to become fully effective, which is a completely undoable, untenable timeline for people that have extremely terrible depressive symptoms. So ketamine is like really a game changer in this realm, especially because even though it has short acting effects, it stacks on itself, it seems. It seems that the whole purpose of it is basically to go in and do a little bit of rewiring, reassociating certain patterns of behavior and thinking over a period of uh, like a condensed period of time, and then slap some therapy on that bad boy and you're good to go. You can fit a whole lot of happiness in this bitch. And then the last thing I'll say um, is... I swear I turn off notifications and it like always gives me notifications. Um, last thing I'll say is just like a precursor for next time is about ketamine bladder cystitis, which is ketamine bladder syndrome, which is, Jesus, here we go. All right, all right, all right. Just kidding. We're going to stop now because that's easier. Uh, okay. I'm going to read this real quick. Uh, it's just about a bunch of nostril talk. Well, we touch on excitotoxicity next time. No, we're going to talk about excitotoxicity when we get to depressants, because that's where it is most applicable. In terms of bladder syndrome, I can definitely tell you about some preliminary ways that you might be able to reduce the risk of bladder syndrome. However, as of right now, the, the most effective way is always going to be to space out your use as much as possible. I would say like no more than once a month if you if you want to be like the, the least conservative and no more than every two months if you want to be like pretty, pretty low risk about it. Hydrating as much as possible is essential to protect your kidney functions. Um, and also like flush your system more effectively. If you want to, you can also supplement green tea extract and uh, NAC potentially are two things that might be useful in that realm. However, no supplement is going to, it's kind of like how you can't just take Adderall and not sleep. Like you can kind of maybe do something, but there isn't enough real research behind it to like fully support any kind of supplementation regimen. Uh, okay, cool. I, I'm gonna stop this recording by internet.